so I want to start by getting a few, a few things off the table. Uh, first of all, why I'm uh, speaking here today. So when I was a kid, I remember Avi every once in a while flying somewhere to somebody's birthday and it always uh, seemed like a very stupid idea in, uh, to celebrate birthdays by having conferences and uh, listening to talks. But now that it's uh, Avi's birthday, uh, I thought uh, it's my chance to participate. And um, Inat uh, mentioned in the morning that uh, she talked about my mathematical success. And uh, because I wasn't so successful, so I ended up going into biology. And because I'm lazy, uh, I've spent the past seven years in the neuroscience department in the Hebrew University uh, doing my PhD. And it's not over yet. So uh, <laughs> this is mainly due to my laziness. And there seems to be also an ongoing competition uh, who can embarrass Avi more and who can praise him more. So on the praise uh, side, I think after some time, the reason I, I ended up going into science um, is something I got from Avi is uh, the way he sees beauty in, uh, in nature. And uh, I think for him, it's mostly in numbers and equations. I don't see the beauty in that, but um, in, in life, uh, I, I, it was more accessible to me, and I, so I ended up going to study biology and uh, later to neuroscience. And on the embarrassing side, I, I don't, it would be too much of an easy game, so <laughs> I won't try too much. Um, maybe I'll uh, use uh, Mike Zucks' uh, approach to embarrass myself. Uh, and uh, okay. And uh, the last thing I need to get off the table is how I met Avi, so... <laughs> and, um, and I want to start by um, reading out this message. So I have to ask your forbid forbiddance for appearing here, since I'm an outsider to most of the fields which uh, form the subject of this conference. Even in the area in which I have some expertise, that of the study of the brain, uh, my connections are almost entirely limited on one side, the physiological side. Uh, the, so the usefulness of what I'm going to say, if any, will therefore be limited to this. I may be able to give you a picture of the physiological approach to these problems and uh, to prepare you to the experience that you will have when you come into closer contact with biology. And this should orient you as to the ideas and the attitudes which you may then expect to encounter. Now, I actually stole this quote uh, from uh, von Neumann. So, uh, it's, it's uh, big shoes. I don't, uh, I don't uh, have any pretense to step into them. But uh, he, he said this when he attended the neuroscience uh, conference in 1948. And uh, actually, 1948 is, uh, is very important for me in the sense of uh, the title of this talk, because I think if Avi was born in 1948, it would be much easier for me to defend the title. So um, I don't know uh, the approaches, the advancements in uh, computer science are uh, maybe getting closer to the brain. Um, so and, and the reason I should say that I uh, chose this title is that also uh, Avi always used to complain that we don't rebel enough against them. So uh, it's a bit of a form of rebellion. Uh, but scientifically, I think it's uh, quite meaningless. Um, better is not very well defined, and, uh, and it's easy to find uh, contradicting examples, like any simple calculator can multiply better than the brain, than our very advanced human brains. Uh, so for all of you that were planning to argue with me about this, I admit it's, uh, it could be wrong. But I can start by asking what uh, brains can do better than computers. And uh, there's a few examples. So uh, they can give lectures and celebrate birthdays. They can uh, pass Turing tests. Uh, they can ask uh, questions and conduct scientific research, and to that end also design and build computers. Uh, and there are these notions of uh, consciousness and attention that uh, are also attributed to the brain. And the common thing about uh, these examples is it's uh, hard to define a function, and I'll uh, get to what I mean by uh, defining a function in a minute. 
But when we do, do neuroscience, uh, so some people are attempting to approach this in neuroscience, but uh, I'll leave that aside, uh, especially the consciousness and attention uh, part. Uh, what I think is good, uh, something that we can uh, study quite well in, uh, in neuroscience, and still the brains do better than computers, are uh, uh, how, how the brain senses and uh, how it controls movement. So, uh, for instance, how, how we see, how we hear. And, uh, and we can define some functions for these. And I should say that uh, we don't really study how, how the brain sees or how it hears. We, we have to reduce these, uh, these problems in order to study them in a controlled manner. And so we, we would uh, like see how the brain responds to specific uh, components of vision or, uh, or of other senses. Um, so the big picture, we're, uh, the way I see it, we're very far from understanding the big picture of how the brain does these things. Any brain, even a frog brain. I think we're in in lower species. We understand uh, sometimes more, but uh, still we're far from having a clear uh, picture of the, the in the broad sense. Uh, so when I say function, um, I'll go again back to my childhood uh, when I first encountered functions uh, in math classes in school and I didn't understand anything the teacher was saying, probably because also the teacher didn't understand it. Uh, I, I went to Avi and uh, I asked him uh, what are functions and he said the, the, it's this entity, you feed it something and out of the other side comes uh, something else. And uh, he also used this explanation uh, for Inat and probably also for Yuval. So this is a picture that uh, Inat drew for his birthday. So you can see this uh, function entity eating the five and out comes the four. <laughs> and, uh, and I want to use an example to, to uh, show what I, uh, to describe what I mean by studying functions in the brain. So uh, I'll use the, the example of the cocktail party problem which was uh, described long ago in 53 by, uh, uh, by a guy called Sherry in this paper. And uh, he asks, um, how do we recognize what one person is saying when others are speaking at the same time? So like in a cocktail party when there's many, many di different people speaking at once. And uh, this is a hard problem because the signal, the actual uh, interesting signal which you want to listen to might be much, much smaller than the noise and still brains do this uh, very easily and almost automatically. And, um, so here is a, um, an example of this. You see here a spectrogram. So you have a, it's a heat map of a time, frequency against time, and the, and the colors mark how much energy there is in a certain frequency at a certain point of time. And the function we would like to understand in the brain is how, so this is uh, two people speaking, and this is just one of the people speaking. So they, in the first, here they overlay the, the uh, the, the sound the two people were making on one on top of the other, but actually you, you would only want this thing in the end. And uh, we would like to know how the brain does this type of thing. And I think it's a good example of a complicated thing we, we can maybe fun uh, study in the brain because we, can, uh, we know what the input and output are and then we can try to peek into the brain and see what it does. Uh, so later on, uh, Sherry in his paper, it's actually all from the, uh, from the introduction, he asks, uh, on what logical basis could one design a machine or a filter for carrying out such an operation? And he suggests uh, a few things. So, and this was back then uh, mostly speculative. Uh, so voices are coming from different directions. So we have actually two ears, so we hear twice and we can compare the physical input to the two ears. Maybe there's information there that can help in this uh, computation. Uh, lip reading gestures and the like. So he's already suggesting that hearing is not uh, simply an auditory task, but it, it needs to involve uh, more senses. And uh, I'll show more examples of this later. Um, and then 
there's a, he suggests different speaking voices, mean pitches, mean speeds, etc. So this is maybe like a higher level analysis of the sound signal. And, uh, and then two more points, which are accents deferring and transition probabilities. So uh, you suggest subject matter. So if I'm giving a neuroscience talk now and uh, suddenly you hear some voices, somebody else speaking about fishing in a Chinese accent, so this is probably meaningless to what I'm trying to say and it would be easy to disregard. Or the brain may use this information that the accent is different, the subject is different, to, to ignore that signal and uh, just tune in to me. Okay, so before I go, get into how I think uh, or the brain does these things and so, show some examples, uh, we should take a step back and ask who has a brain. <laughs> And we can look at the uh, Bart Simpson's uh, Tree of Life. If I don't have enough time to go through it, but it's uh, actually quite uh, amusing. And uh, so I outlined all of the, all of the organisms here that do. And um, it's basically all of the animal kingdom, uh, from very low life forms like uh, worms to uh, humans and the. Uh, and the organisms that don't have a brain are ones like uh, single-celled animals and uh, fungi and so on. And, um, and then the next question we should ask is why brains exist and the simple uh, answer would be to sense the environment and control movement. But here you can see these flowers, so this is a time-lapse video, the, the sun is just coming into view. So they track the sun as it's uh, moving in the sky and, uh, and they move they actually physically move, so they're, uh, they're both sensing and uh, moving. And if you think in the computer side of this, uh, you wouldn't need a supercomputer in order to, to do something uh, similar uh, artificially, so like uh, control of this uh, solar panel, which needs to have maximum sunlight during the day. Um, so simple, uh, simple sensing and simple movements don't require a brain. And I think a beautiful example of why uh, brains do exist is this creature. Uh, it's called the sea squirt. This is the larva of a sea squirt after it hatches. And um, a bit like a fish maybe, it uh, swims in the water. It has eyes so it can sense, maybe other senses, I don't know. And uh, it spends its larval state uh, by uh, looking for a rock and then it finds a nice rock that it's happy with and uh, it uh, settles there and it uh, morphs into its adult life form, which is this. Um, and then it has a very fulfilling life of uh, eating and reproducing. And here it looks uh, more like a plant and the interesting thing is that uh, in this process of morphing from the larval state to the adult state, it digests its brain. So it doesn't need it anymore. And uh, the usual joke that goes with this is that when you get tenure, you don't need a brain anymore. <laughs> um, but I think the idea is that uh, movement within the changing environment uh, requires a brain. And the reason for this is that uh, when you move in your surroundings, uh, you actually affect the sensory input that you perceive, that you pick up passively even. Um, so, an example, uh, an example of why, why this would be important is if I'm going to punch myself now, it, it has a massive effect on my uh, visual input, and yet I don't react to it because I, I can, uh, in a sense, I know I'm going to, to see my fist uh, in front of my face, and uh, it's uh, predictable and uh, I can disregard it. Um, but on the other hand, if uh, somebody is still pissed off about my title and will come up on the stage and punch me, I'll probably have to react. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I, I, th this, is, uh, this is what I mean by saying uh, that w when you move through the environment, you actually affect the, directly the sensory input you get, and it's not necessarily interesting. And I think uh, this is why brains developed. Uh, another good example is that you can't tickle yourself because you know exactly the movement that's going to come and you, uh, you don't get tickled. And maybe also in the sense of uh, the evolution of computers where it 
this, these kinds of ideas are really important are uh, in self-driving cars because they're actually now uh, performing something that you would expect from a, a, an organism with a brain. So the question remains, uh, why do brains exist? And uh, I want to propose that uh, there are uh, good machines in predicting the future. And uh, I'll say in a minute why, why I think this is true, but uh, I can go back to this example. And there could actually be many different solutions uh, to this problem, how to filter out uh, uh, what you don't want to listen to. And one of, the, one of the possible solutions is if you knew what, the other, this, what this person is going to say, you could use that information in order to not listen to anything else. Now this sounds maybe a bit far-fetched, but uh, if you know Avi, he always, uh, he always knows what you're going to say, so <laughs> uh, his brain definitely works like, what? <laughs> That's also true. Um, so, so the, so, so that's, a, that's maybe the extreme sense of a prediction, but uh, I want to show you that the brain actually can, uh, can make very good predictions about, uh, about sensory input and, uh, and use this knowledge uh, in order to tune into what's uh, really important. Um, so when I was uh, preparing for this and I was thinking uh, what's the big difference between a brain and a computer, um, I think one question, I know algorithms are getting better, but uh, I think, and I, I don't know, you can tell me, but uh, still the computational power you need in order to perform tasks that uh, kind of mimic uh, uh, how the brain works are are quite, uh, you need quite a lot of computational power still. Maybe this uh, will uh, go down, but uh, I was looking into uh, how much computational power the brain has. So if you take a vision, for instance, uh, you start with uh, uh, the visual scene around you. It has basically unlimited information. And uh, and through optics, this, uh, this is reduced, so it's estimated that on the retinal images have uh, about uh, 10 to the 10th uh, bits of uh, a second of information. And then uh, through the hardware of the eye and the retinal processing into the optic nerve, which is what feeds this information to the brain, uh, you lose about uh, four orders of magnitude of the information. So that's a lot already, and this is just uh, due to hardware. Uh, and then, then you look actually what happens in the brain and they, there are estimates about how much, uh, how much of this information the brain really uses. And uh, it's estimated that uh, 10 to the fourth bits a second. And these estimates are uh, made by the uh, mutual information between neural activity and the sensory input. So I find this uh, really amazing. The brain doesn't need to see much in order to see perfectly well, like most of us do. And um, yeah, so it's, it still manages to, to do this uh, very well. And, um, and I think it uh, boils down to this question is uh, to determine within all this information that's uh, being fed into the brain, what's the signal and what's the noise? And if there's one thing that I'm sure the brain is very, very good at, it's this. And, uh, and the idea of uh, making uh, predictions, so I don't have a way to prove this, but I think the, the brain uh, has kind of like an internal model of the world, which is constantly updated, and, uh, and it compares the sensory input to this model. And, and then it, could be sens it would be much easier to be sensitive to certain things, like if something is surprising, it doesn't fit your model, maybe you need to pay attention to it. So my punch to myself was not surprising. There's uh, nothing interesting in it, but uh, somebody else punching me is, uh, is bad. And uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I think this, this is a... Uh, Okay, I think th this is kind of the main point of, the, of this talk, and I, 
Now I will uh, try to show you examples of uh, how this is done. And, ah, just uh, as a, I'm not going to talk about this at all, but it's just uh, nice to see that uh, it, what goes into memory later is uh, extremely small uh, amount of information according to these <laughs> estimates. Uh, so I was told before I talk about the uh, data uh, in the brain, I should tell you how the brain works. And I will use uh, this, to ah. I will try to use this uh, uh, software that a friend of mine wrote as an educational thing. So the um, brain has uh, neurons. Uh, ah, this is not on your screen. Now it's on your screen. And it's blank. Why is it blank? It's not good. Okay, so we'll skip it. Do you want me to? No, it's okay. Ah, it's here. Okay. Uh, so the brain has uh, neurons like this one. Uh, it's a cell. It's the main uh, important cell in the brain. Um, and it has a, it's composed of a cell body and a dendrite. So uh, dendrites are kind of like antennas uh, that can pick up signals. And uh, it's believed that the, the, the computational unit is, a, is the cell body. So if for some reason, so, and then there's connections between these uh, neurons, like uh, this. So a cell can send an axon to another neuron. and uh, I'll play this, so uh, if this, this uh, our first cell, let's say it's a visual cell, it gets input as light into the eye, it, it can uh, fire a spike. So that's this uh, blue dot that's going pretty quickly on the screen. And uh, when we do our uh, neuroscience research, we try to measure how these, uh, what these uh, neurons are doing. So we stick electrodes into the brain and uh, can record uh, their spiking activity or, or their, uh, what's going on, on inside the cell, how they compute. So uh, if, I, if I make a spike there, you see the response in the next cell, which was also a spike. And, um, and then you have, uh, so the brain doesn't have oops, just two neurons, but it has uh, uh, many, many neurons, and they are, uh, all, uh, we believe uh, today that they are tightly connected, everything is uh, connected to everything, so uh, visual neurons also go to uh, auditory processing areas and so forth. Uh, and then you can have uh, in a network, uh, you can start with a spike and then uh, more spikes appear and then later on you, you can have uh, inhibitory neurons that uh, actually modulate this in order that the network won't uh, blow up. Um, and this is a, so, okay, so neuro, the brain is uh, quite simple. And, uh, and, <laughs> and we record this, so now there's uh, a lot of spikes. There's more uh, sophist sophisticated, mo the data I will show you today is uh, mostly like this, uh, re electrical recordings of spikes, but there's more sophisticated uh, ways of doing this today with the uh, imaging techniques. So instead of looking at one neuron, you can look at the population, at the local network of neurons. Um, and, and there's even more, uh, uh, there's other ways of looking like MRI and EEG, which uh, all, all tell us uh, different things about the, it's different measurements that we can uh, do uh, in neuroscience. Um, and all, again, all of the data I'm going to show today is from animals because people usually don't like uh, having electrodes or microscopes stuck in their brain. So for the lighthearted, there's not any gory, uh, gory pictures, but... Uh, okay, I'll go back to this. Okay. Okay, so we talked about the brain uh, making predictions and uh, I want to say, uh, I think it has a, uh, I said in the beginning that we don't really understand uh, how the brain works. We can't look at vision as a whole, uh, but I think we can get some good concepts as to uh, 
what types of uh, computations the brain is doing and uh, and maybe these, uh, so I, I don't think that any time soon we will be able to say we solve the problem of the brain and we can create a good model of the brain, but I think uh, we can use these concepts in order to, to understand a lot more and maybe they're implementable in, uh, I'm sure that they are being in, implemented in the artificial, uh, 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 in computers that are trying to do these uh, types of tasks. Uh, so the, the three ways uh, are to use information about the past to predict the future, the, about the present, and about the future to predict the future. Okay, so, and I will give uh, one example uh, to each of these. Um, so the first example is uh, how the brain uses information about the past. And the example is uh, from, this is main research of, uh, from uh, Ellie Nelkin's lab, which is one of my advisors. And I need you to listen to this for a bit. So there are, uh, we can stop it, I think. There are two sounds being played. One of them is being played many times, and uh, it's a common sound, and the, and the other sound is a rare sound. Um, in this case, it, uh, it appears uh, randomly, but uh, at a probability of five uh, percent, and uh, and we check they, they check how uh, how neurons in the auditory cortex respond to this, uh, and I have to make a long story very short. But um, uh, in red here, you see the response to to this uh, red sound, and in blue, you see the response to the same sound but when the probabilities were flipped. So I, this is important because it's not a property, a, a tuning property of the neuron, but it's the, the, the fact that it, this response is bigger is due to, just due to the fact that it's a rare sound. So it's listening, these, uh, these are poor rats, they listen for hours to these uh, beeping sounds, and they, they kind of uh, get used to the common sound and every once in a while, the rare sound appears, and, and they're surprised to it. And this appears, uh, this phenomenon appears throughout uh, most of the auditory system, uh, not very, very low down, but further on. So it's it's like it seems to be a fundamental principle of uh, of auditory processing to be sensitive to something that's surprising. And uh, and if you take it. So the, it's, again, I said we use reduction, but it, if you take it into the context of the ideas I showed in the beginning about uh, the cocktail party, uh, and somebody saying something with a Chinese accent about uh, fishing, so this would be surprising, and you, the brain would uh, supposedly respond more to that, and then it can choose whether it's uh, interesting or not. But, uh, but this type of uh, information is, uh, the, or this, these types of responses appear, uh, appear a lot throughout the brain. So the idea is that the statistical knowledge of the past inputs helps in shaping responses to future uh, stimuli. Okay, so, uh, the, the next uh, example is, uh, is how we, the brain uses information about the future in order to predict the future. And uh, the example is from this uh, so sharks uh, have another sense that we unfortunately don't have, and that's the ability to sense electric fields in, in the water. And uh, you see this shark swimming around, and you'll see the picture from above. So the experimenter here uh, is producing some uh, electric field within that circle, and the shark is uh, kind of checking it out. It wants to know what's going on there. And there is no other uh, stimulus except the electric field that would cause this preference to go there. And uh, we know somewhat how this is uh, done. The, the, the sharks uh, have uh, these uh, um, electro sensors on, mostly on their face, and uh, they just pick up uh, changes in the electric field. Now, the there is a big problem in this, it's, and it's that every every living organism or at least a big organism uh, swimming throughout water will uh, change the electric field around them. So, uh, so this shark, whose goal I think is to eat a fish, which 
could, and you can find the fish uh, potentially by uh, picking up its electric signal, even in murky water where there is no vision, uh, where vision is not possible, he's mostly picking up uh, his own signal. And this is about three orders of magnitude bigger than the signal that's being produced by the fish. So you need to do like a, a very uh, immense amount of filtering in order to, to pick up this signal. And um, you can see this by, uh, if you record from the nerve coming out of these uh, sensors, um, so these are spikes like I showed you in before, there's electrode uh, stuck right on the, on the nerve. And uh, you can see this neuron is uh, spiking all the time, so it's sending some uh, information to the brain. And here, uh, V, this shark is immobilized while they're doing this uh, recording, but it still uh, breathes. So breathing in this case is opening and closing of uh, its gills. And this is the mo only motor action it's, uh, it's making. And they, uh, they just measure this. And if you can see that the spikes are uh, time locked uh, to, to a certain uh, part of this breathing cycle, the uh, ventilation cycle. And then if you add uh, some external uh, stimulus, which in this case is a uh, changing electric field in uh, like uh, changes like a sine wave, uh, you can see that it, it kind of looks like the, there was a sum of a, something uh, on top of this signal. So if they coincide in a, in the right place, there's more spikes, and if they coincide in the wrong place, there's less spikes. Now, this information goes into, into the brain, into this uh, structure called the DON, and uh, it has a, it's a very beautiful structure that has, a, has these neurons, the AEN neurons, they're the only output to the system, and the information from the electrosensors is fed into one side, into, they have one dendrite going up, one dendrite going down. So this information is uh, fed into the, into the basal dendrite. And then on the apical dendrite, the top one, uh, there is a, another set of information coming in, and this is uh, copies of motor actions uh, that go general, all motor actions, and in this case, again, it's only ventilating. So uh, these are, these are potent, uh, presumably the only signals that will come in at this point, but uh, if it has some knowledge, if it learned throughout its life that uh, how, how the movement of the gills will affect the sensory, the, the electric field around them, he can then subtract it from the total signal and, uh, and, and just convey what's, uh, what's uh, not part of that signal. And this you can see very nicely if you record from these uh, neurons their spiking activity. So if it's just ventilating, they have no output. And you add this sine wave, and it's only, it's only spiking when uh, the sine wave is uh, at its uh, peak. So I think the conclusion is that uh, knowledge of uh, future mot motor actions helps to predict uh, the consequence of these actions on the sensory input, and that can be used in order to cancel out uh, what's uh, not interesting. So th this is kind of uh, building this uh, model of, uh, of the world and, uh, and comparing that to, to what you actually get in. And the last thing uh, I should say, and this is uh, the work that I've been doing in the past few years, is uh, the use of uh, information of the present in order to, to predict the future or create this internal model of the world. And um, I'll start by... Uh, by uh, describing this thing that might happen to you if you're uh, walking around in the jungle, there could be a tiger that uh, decides to eat you, and the natural thing would be to run away. And uh, if you're running away, you don't see it, you want to know where it is in order to successfully run away. So the information you might, uh, you might use in order to know where the tiger is, is the sounds it's making, like this uh, ra. Uh, I am a graduate student and I'm lost. <laughs> um, and, I, and I want to describe two scenarios that uh, might happen to you when you're trying to escape from this tiger. Uh, the first one is uh, the tiger decides to change its uh, attack strategy and do a maneuver to the left. 
And um, so you can, see, you can see him jumping to the left, and then he's, he's uh, not behind you anymore. He's somewhere back there. And he's still making a row. You can still pick this up. And potentially, the brain uh, should be able to compute this uh, change of angle. And then you might decide to react in the appropriate way, like running more to the right. Now, the second scenario that might happen is, uh, again, uh, we'll start with the initial condition of the tiger behind you. But uh, you decide to turn your head. And since you pick up uh, the auditory signal to your ears and they're connected to your head, if you, change, if you move your head, then you will have uh, an exactly the same uh, relative change in angle between the sound source and, uh, and, and yourself. And uh, eventually, you want to avoid uh, this. <laughs> so in, in, uh, in both cases, the physical signal that you're picking up is exactly the same. And, uh, and actually, the, the solution, I think, is very intuitive. You just need to know that you moved your head. But we wanted to see uh, how the brain does this, if we, can, if we can see how the brain is making this computation. And, um, and more formally now, just to, these are, I think these are the, the essential things you need to know in order to successfully uh, escape the tiger. Uh, so whether it's making a sound at all, you need the auditory signal. You need to know the location of the, of the tiger or the sound source uh, relative to your ears. And you need to know where your head and ears are. And uh, if you succeed in all three of these, uh, you will know where the tiger is and hopefully escape. So we, we study this and uh, it's actually quite interesting. In, in the first station of auditory processing, so uh, it's not like a very high level brain function. It's in the brainstem, the, the, really the first uh, point that information enters the brain from the ear. And uh, this doesn't matter. The, this information later goes on to higher uh, brain areas. Um, this is the circuitry of this uh, nucleus. It's called the dorsal cochlear nucleus. And, and you can see it's a bit similar to the picture that I showed before uh, in the shark, that there's a, there's the, these are the main cells. They're the only output to this uh, system. They have some type of information coming in from the bottom, some other type of information coming in from the uh, top. In this case, the location signal of the, of the sound source is coming in uh, from one side. And, uh, and I will show you what type of information we look at that comes in from the top in a second. Uh, these are uh, uh, pictures of uh, neurons that I recorded from. Uh, so the first thing we needed to know is whether this wasn't uh, put very well or wasn't studied very much before, so um, we wanted to make sure that these uh, neurons really uh, show where sound is coming from, so we built a system that we can uh, move speakers around the head of the rat and uh, play sounds, and uh, in the meanwhile uh, record from these neurons. And, uh, and we see here, uh, again, a heat map. This time, it's the, it's the neuron response as a function of where sound was coming from. And you can see these are the spike rates. So there's, a, a, there, there's big differences in the responses of the neurons just according to where sound was coming from. This was not uh, very surprising, but we needed to verify it. And, um, and the next thing we wanted to see is, uh, so I presented it with turning of the head. Uh, these experiments are in anesthetized rats, so they don't move their head, but we can rotate them. And the, also inside the ear, although it's not part of the auditory system, there is a, a, this vestibular apparatus, which is, it looks a bit like a gyroscope, and uh, it picks up uh, acceleration signals in, uh, in three rotational uh, axes, and also there's uh, two linear accelerators for back and forth. So then if we, if we rotate the rat, this should know that uh, the rat is being even passively rotated. And uh, we had uh, some evidence uh, from previous work that uh, this information also feeds into this same nucleus. And uh, so this is what this, uh, I'm, I'm not very good at drawing, so my rats look like cats. And, uh, 
And then we wanted to see what, how the neurons are responding when we just rotate it without, uh, without making any sound. Um, so if you can see the line moving, uh, that's time and the, and the rat rotating. And these neurons were uh, spiking even before we did anything. This is a property of, these, uh, of many neurons in the brain, but also these, that they, they, they fire spontaneously. Um, but as you can see, as, as uh, rotation starts, I think here, uh, or somewhere along the rotation axis, the firing rate changes, and there's many more spikes later on. And the spikes also, uh, the, the firing rate of this neuron stays uh, higher also when we stop the movement. So it's not just a response to movement. And it's a, we believe it's a response to, to location. And when we turn it back, it will go back to the, uh, to the right firing rate as it was uh, b before we made the initial movement. And, uh, and if you check this uh, amongst many neurons, um, so here you see each line is the response of new, one neuron, uh, the, the normalized response, and uh, so you have 30-something uh, neurons. And you can see, so I arranged them uh, to look like this, but uh, each one has like a certain point in space that, it's, uh, that, that it changes its firing rate. Um, and, and then you, it's easy to see that from this you can get, uh, if you do something very simple like summing them, you can actually, uh, summing all of these responses, you can tell where, you can give a specific angle to where the head is pointing. Um, and, uh, and then the important question is again this, uh, so how do these two, two senses interact in order to give a, a a clear picture of where the where the tiger is. Uh, if I didn't say that, that 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 was the same type of neuron, so it's the auditory neuron responding to the vestibular information. Um, so we we conduct uh, this experiment in a more controlled manner. So now we can uh, we can play a sound and rotate the the rat, or uh, play a sound and rotate the speaker. And again, the physical input to the ears is exactly the same in both cases, and we, we went to some effort to verify this. And, and then we can look at the neuron's response. So this is what, when the speaker was moving. Uh, so th this is a time, and this is the, the average response. This is one repetition, and this is the average of, I think, 10. And you can see, so the first property of these neurons is that they respond to sound. So this black line is when sound was played. So once I turn on the sound, there is a, there is a big response. And then movement is, is uh, over here between one and four seconds. And you see that this response is being modulated. And this is just like I showed you in this uh, heat map before. It's, it's the, the neuron sensitivity to where sound is coming from. So, here, there is nothing surprising. This is what we would expect from the data I showed you before. But is it surprising that the brain filters out the fluid movement inside the vestibular systems? That it fill, I don't. Filters out the fluid movement inside the vestibular. How the? Okay, I don't want to get into how the vestibular system works. I also am not an expert on that. Um, so, you the same effect, you the rat, or you just the no, I okay. So, so this is what happens when I rotate the rat. This blue line. Okay. So I, I want to compare. This, this is this is the the goal of the study in a sense to compare these uh, these responses. And, and you can it, it's not. I think this one single single example is not very interesting. It responds differently. So when the when the rat was uh, was being rotated, the, the response is a bit higher. And uh, so just this one single example is not very interesting. But already we have a hint that maybe there is a computation being carried out that takes into account uh, the rat's own movement. Um, and I'll go back to these these questions that we wanted to answer in order to to see whether whether the brain can, uh, or whether this part of the brain has an accurate, uh, ha has the information as, as to where the brain, the sound really is coming from. So we need to answer these three questions. 
And now what I'm doing, so this is a graph like I showed you before of the responses to uh, when, the, when it was rotated without sound, when, when the rat was rotated with the sound signal, and when the sound signal was rotating around the rat. But we plotted for all neurons and uh, consecutively. And we want to, the question is, and it looks like a big mess. So you, you, it's hard to see at least uh, visually a, any pattern other than that the, the responses in this part of the experiment and in this part of the experiment are a bit higher, but these are when there was sound being played. So it's natural that the auditory neurons would respond more to sound to when there is sound to, as to where there wasn't. And, uh, and we try to fit a model that, uh, so it's a very simple uh, linear regression uh, that's taking all of the population of neurons' uh, responses. And uh, it, it should fit, uh, in this case, if we want to know whether sound was, being, uh, was present at that point in time, so it, it should fit out this thing that gives you a one when there was sound and a zero when there wasn't any sound being played. And the model, uh, so this brown line is the output of the model, and it's not very surprising, like I said, that it does it very well because it's, it's the most basic type of information you would expect the auditory system to have. Um, and, and what's nice is that uh, if you have, uh, so this is for many neurons, and you, we start taking them out of the model, we actually take the best, the most informative ones out of the model, and uh, this is the error of the model now. And you see that it does very well until there's very few neurons in, the, in this uh, population. That's also not surprising, again, for the same reason. Uh, but then, more interestingly, it, it can, uh, there is information, very accurate information about the, the relative angle between the, so where sound was coming from generally. But this is regardless, so the model takes in, in, in the same time that the instances where the rat was moving and when the, and when the speaker was moving, and we saw the responses were different. So the model can, uh, can capture this information also, and it can also capture the, the information as to where the head of the rat was, uh, when, uh, regardless of whether sound was being played or wasn't being played. Uh, so we concluded or, uh, that, that basically the, this structure can already at the first level of processing uh, do a quite complicated uh, computation of, uh, of disregarding uh, my own movements in order to give an accurate, accurate representation of what's go really going on outside. Um, so this is, a, this is the last point, that the integration of different sensory modalities uh, modulates responses of uh, present stimuli to disentangle the, the self-produced uh, changes uh, from, the, from the external changes uh, that happened in the world. And I think, uh, I think these, uh, all these three together are, are basic concepts of how the, how the brain really uh, can, uh, can make these predictions in order to to become a very good filter, to very accurately uh, decide what's, what's a real signal and what's a noise. And I think I don't have any more time, so there's no time for the demo. And I should, uh, I should thank my uh, cousin Leo for these, uh, these wonderful uh, drawings, and my uh, advisors, uh, Yossi Arom and Eli Nelkin, for uh, the work we do together and uh, Mazal Tov. <laughs>
So, so the processing, uh, to, to, I don't think a single neuron is very informative uh, at all, but the population, uh, the network kind of uh, uh, does this processing. No, you would feed it into a totally different uh, data. It, it, this is just a linear regression. We train it on half of the data, and we feed in the other half, and, uh, and we check whether it works. And so it's, it's a very simple, but maybe I should say that uh, the most simple computation that neurons can do are linear regressions. They, they, they get input through these synapses. They can modulate the, the strength or the weight of this input, and they add it up in the uh, in the cell body. So, this is kind of like uh, the most basic thing. If all of this was fed into one neuron, you could easily conceive of it uh, uh, reading out this information. Or maybe one neuron would read out when there was sound. One neuron would read out. You you would need a different neuron for each. But uh, yes. Yeah. I have a general question, but the cocktail time. Yeah. Yes. And some people, unfortunately, have a bad habit of texting and not paying attention to a talk, even if it's very, very exciting and stimulating conference. Do they still get something out of this? Speaking by I'm, I'm, another brain can get something out of this? I, I said before, I'm not an expert. If I was dealing with humans, they wouldn't be happy, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah. One last question. Yeah. I have a, um, a question. What is your prediction if instead that he was not anesthetized and somehow he knew that he was turning the head, would he filter how would it, uh, how would it I, I think it would be much easier because like I showed in the shark, it would have a uh, there should be some uh, copies of motor commands also going to this structure. So it, it would actually it wouldn't it maybe wouldn't even need the vestibular system because it would know that it's turning its head in the first place. But it, it, these two things can work together. So, but can you predict how much amplified would be the precision of the responsiveness? If, uh, if you, because somewhere you know, you, you not know that you actually what you did the whole time. Right? I, if, the answer is no, I cannot predict this. And uh, I think that right now it, the, model, the model surprised us how well, uh, how well it performs. Uh, under these limited conditions, so uh, and, the, and the brain is always noisy. You, you never get the accurate information in the brain. So, within the noise you expect, I think this, this by itself is good. And I, I couldn't expect uh, a lot of times. Uh, no, th this is contradictory to what I wa was saying. So maybe I shouldn't say. <laughs> but a lot of times, actually, the brain is a, is a more precise than behavior. So, but that's. Uh, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> Thank you, Al, and then go to the group photo. So.